Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Cincinnati USA Regional Chambers Leadership Now series. We're thrilled you decided to spend the morning here with us today. This series is really an extension of the Chambers Leadership Programs to help you lead during this time. We are incredibly thankful to Fifth Third for being our presenting sponsor. Fifth Third really believes and is committed to educating and inspiring leaders during this time and candidly all the time. So thank you again and a special shout out to our friends at Fifth Third. I'm Amy Thompson, the Leadership Program Senior Director and I'm glad you've joined us. I have to tell you, I'm really looking forward to this conversation today. I think we are going to have a great, great conversation and I hope it inspires you to continue to lead and step up in this virtual time. Hopefully you've been using the chamber as a resource to help you navigate whether it's tuning in to our daily emails or using our resource hub. Please know that the chamber is here to help you and your business through this time. You all have tuned in and are on mute uh, with your audio off as well and, and video. So how will we interact today? What we're gonna encourage you to do is pull up your Q&A and your chat feature. Q&A, please use that if you have a question you'd like to pose to Ryan or myself through the conversation. And then the chat, we will use that for the interactive components of our session today. If you're inspired by something you hear and want to share a link or information with the other folks that are on the call, please use the chat function so people can see that. All right, well, let's have some fun. And let me tell you about this great guy that's going to inspire us all this morning. So we are truly fortunate to have a wonderful leader, a connector, a collaborator. Ryan Hawk is with us today. So Ryan, thank you for being here. I want to tell people a little bit more of great things about you and then we're going to dive in, my friend. So Ryan, I know you're a keynote speaker, you're an author, you're an advisor, you host the Learning Leader Show. That's a podcast gosh, that has millions of listeners in over 150 countries. Truly amazing. And uh, and you'll see it's a little dog-eared, my new book, book that I have from you. So thank you for taking time to write that. I, I love some of the nuggets I've been pulling out. You're truly just a lifelong student of leadership and um, a quarterback and VP of both sales and billion dollar, with billion dollar companies in the past. So you've had that real life experience as well. And today you're also heading up Brixie and Meyer's leadership advisory practice. I could go on and on my friend, you're doing great things essentially what I need to say. So, Ryan, thank you for being here. Thank you for all that you're doing to help inspire and teach leaders to be the best that they can. And I know as we jump in, you have a quick exercise you want to take us through so that we can really get into the moment. Sure. Well, thank you for the very kind uh, introduction, Amy. I'm excited to be here. I actually learned of this exercise from a friend of mine uh, who spoke for, I've been doing work with the Cleveland Indians, and this is something I think to help us frame our minds properly because most of us at this point are probably Zoomed out, meaning we've all been a part of many Zoom meetings over the past two months. And so what I'd like to ask you, uh, and type this in the chat uh, as we get going, is we have a choice to make right now. And that choice is how focused will we choose to be over the course of this, of our time together. Um, and I want, I want you to, to type it and make that commitment in the Zoom chat. And so what, what we have here is you see a one to five scale of how focused will you be type. Uh, if you type one or near that, that means I, I will have this on in the background. I may listen for bits and pieces, but I'll also be looking at my phone, multitasking and doing other work. Five says I am 100% dialed in, listening to the dulcet tones of this podcaster's voice, who's going to do everything he can to try to make this engaging and entertaining and useful and something that you can take back to your teams and your families. And so I, uh, I love, okay, Johnny Cryable, Kelly, Gary's at a five. Oh, we got a four. Okay, 4.25. I get it with the kids. I understand the 4.25. I've had probably some twos and threes when the kids are there. So I, I'm with you. I see it. Jackie, Matt. Okay, Sean, Leslie. 
All right. Okay. We got some good ones here. So uh, Masanori, he's from Japan. Uh, so he's dialed in. What time is it for, for you there? I, I, I know we emailed about this one. So we, we got people from all over the world that are joining. It's good to see. Okay. T Tina might go from a five to a four. So I understand. I understand. And I think that's the, that's the cool part about what we're doing is we're trying to multitask. We're trying to do the best we can. And, and I think it's also good for us to, to, to show some grace for one another because we're all dealing with some wild things going on. I know, I don't know about you, but, but Amy, my job as a homeschooling teacher, uh, I'd probably get an F uh, if you had to grade me as far as how good I am at a job. Fortunately for me, I have an amazing wife, Miranda, who would get an A plus. And so together we're about a C. And, uh, and luck luckily though, that I, she can raise my average up a little bit, but I'm excited to be here. I'm glad to see so many fives. Uh, let, let's, let's get this thing going, Amy. Let's do it. Ryan, thank you. What a great way to just kind of focus and get ourselves in the moment. And really, that's a nice exercise to do, not just right now, but many times when we jump into a meeting and to just be candid and real with each other. We have to have grace because you're right. Uh, my dog might bark in a minute or my, my kiddo <laughs> might wake up and come running in. Speaking of, you mentioned your wife and you mentioned your kiddos. Ryan, before we jump in, I know listeners often want to understand who is this crazy guy that we're talking to. So give us a little bit of who you are. I know we talked about your bio, but share with us today our conversation's really about stepping up. So if you can give us some background and think about stepping up, what are moments both personally and professionally? I bet you had to step up when you became a dad and in your different, um, just take us briefly through how do we get to know you and moments you've stepped up. Yeah, I, I think Amy, a good a good time to focus. So I had uh, I was working as a sales manager at Lexus Nexus, and I'd finished my MBA. Uh, and fortunately, Lexus is a, is a fantastic company that would reimburse you and pay for you to get your MBA. Um, and, and around that time, this was five plus years ago. Around that time, uh, I was considering going back to school to to utilize more of that investment that Lexus was willing to put in their employees to get a further education. And at that exact same moment, I was very lucky to have somebody um, set me up uh, uh, with with a group dinner with a guy by the name of Todd Wagner. And Todd Wagner is the uh, him and Mark Cuban are business partners. They were the creators, the founders and creators of Broadcast.com. And Todd and Mark eventually sold Broadcast.com to Yahoo for $5.7 billion, making Mark <clears throat> and Todd both billionaires. And the interesting aspect about that was I'm sitting at this dinner and both Todd and I both got there early. It was a group dinner, but we both had gotten there early. So I had some one-on-one -on -one time with him. And, and I just kind of unloaded my curiosity on trying to understand his story with just peppering him with question after question about the beginnings, the, the, the initiation, his process, how he was able to have the guts to sit across face to face with the leaders at Yahoo. And this is when Yahoo was like Google and convinced them to buy his company for 5.7 billion. And I was enthralled, amazed by the stories. I loved every aspect of that conversation and I thought, instead of going back for another graduate degree, could I create my own form of a leadership PhD program where I get to choose all of the professors and I can go directly to them and ask them exactly what I'm most curious about? And another idea, what if I did this in public, recorded all those conversations, shared those with, uh, with other people, potentially embarrass myself as they hear how stupid I am learning <laughs> along the way with me. But the cool part about it is maybe others could then learn as I'm creating this curriculum with these masterclass teachers. And so that's, that's why I started my, my podcast, The Learning Leader Show, five plus years ago, really out of just trying to follow my curiosity and passions with great rigor. And that was my way of doing it. And I thought if I create some sort of a platform, it will, it will be a good reason for other people to want to say yes when I, when I send them a cold email to reach out to be a part uh, of my podcast to say, hey, maybe if I build something, they'll want to say yes. And fortunately, as it's grown over the years, I've got a chance to meet and speak with, with my heroes and, and learn directly from them, record all of those, and then others can learn along with me. And so my, I, I would say my favorite aspects of this, Amy, is the fact that uh, the, the, the ability to build a community uh, because we're growth-oriented type people 
uh, is, is very rewarding work. And on top of that, building relationships, true friendships with your heroes um, has been fantastic. And people say you shouldn't meet your heroes. And I've been lucky to meet a lot of them and almost never let down. And that's, that's the cool part about what I get to do. And, 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 and because it's gone pretty well, it's afforded me the opportunity to meet more and more and expand the reach and create a bigger platform. And to here now build a business with, 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 with the great people at Brixie and Meyer, uh, where I have run the leadership advisory practice and partner up with Doug Meyer, Dave Brixie, and all of the incredible leaders here. Um, it's really, it's really pretty cool uh, that we get a chance to do this because uh, I, I don't, I feel fortunate to be able to follow my curiosity on a daily basis. And that gets to be my full-time job. So Ryan, you've said some many things that I'm tuned into, and I bet our listeners are as well. And I'm actually want to build on that and ask our listeners to take a moment. I'm hoping each of you have pen and paper with you. And instead of putting in the chat, I, I know that it's just as important for us to go pen to paper. There's a lot of research that says if we go pen to paper, then it's going to happen. Here's what I'd like people to do for a moment. You heard Ryan talk about curiosity. It was his curiosity that led him on this path. And as leaders, we have got to continue to be curious. Take a moment, jot down two things that right now you are curious about. What are two things for all the listeners on the call that you are curious about and you want to continue to learn more? Ryan, while, while people are taking a moment to jot that down, I want them to have a little self-reflection before we, we jump in there with the chat. I know you've had a chance to meet and talk with many of your role models and um, just, gosh, and those heroes out there that are leading some great work, whether they're frontline and in the trenches and leading day to day, or you've got those students of leadership who are doing incredible research. You know, you've, you've spoken with experts like Simon Sinek and Jim Collins and Patrick Lencioni and Malcolm Gladwell. I mean, Gosh, I'm just jealous naming some of those. When you think about those conversations, can you pull out any nuggets? I'm sure there was a theme that many of them were curious. They wanted to know more. What are some nuggets you pull from those conversations? Well, there's, there's so much, Amy, but I, I think one of the keys, and I've, I've focused on this for a portion of, of my book, is as, I, as I've thought about uh, I'm always trying to understand and deconstruct the commonalities among leaders who have sustained excellence. And for longtime listeners, they know that's a big question that I ask everybody I speak with, whether I'm recording or not. So really thinking about the deconstruction of what excellence is and how, how the behaviors that lead to excellent performance, excellent results, excellent leadership. And, and so I, what we came, came down with when I was writing and really uh, thinking about this is we've all had leaders, bosses, or coaches we've, we've worked with or worked for that we were forced to comply based upon their position. If they're your boss and they say something, you, you pretty much have to do it or you'll get fired if you don't do it enough. But on the other hand, Amy, we've had those same bosses, coaches, or leaders that we chose, we made a distinctive choice to commit to them. And so compliance is something that can be commanded. Commitment cannot. That comes from the followers. That comes from the people. So when I think for each, for each person here, and maybe we can type this in the chat box, I, I, the difference between let's, let's think back in our lives to those people we've worked with where we were forced to comply. And, and, and what were the behaviors of that person? Why, why was it someone that I didn't want to commit to, but I complied because I had to versus, and I immediately have the, the bosses coming to my mind, the coaches coming to mind, those people that I chose to commit to and why, what was it about them? So we have these, these distinct factors, behaviors. Okay. Who was the compliant one? The ones where I just complied because I had to versus the ones I chose to commit to. What was it? Why? Think about that. The reason why I think this is a useful exercise <clears throat> is because we can analyze this and say, okay, this sounds simplistic or basic, but when I really analyze and reflect on this, I, I want to be this type of leader. 
that's how I view this, Amy. When, when, when I'm thinking about the type of person I want to be, I'm analyzing all of the greats, the ones I've spoken to, I've learned from, I've worked for, I've worked with, alongside, partnered with, and said, I chose to commit to someone like Doug Meyer here at Brixie and Meyer because of his integrity, because of his love, because of how much he cares for his family, like things that you don't necessarily see or think. But but I, when I reflect on that, and so I think for everybody here, it's useful to do that exercise. Who have you committed to versus the ones who you've complied to? And I think that's a, a worthy exercise now if you want to do that, Amy. Absolutely. Let's take a moment in the, in the chat, and I see some good things coming in already. When you think about that leader, what are those different characteristics? A committed versus a compliant? Go ahead and throw those in there. Let's see what's resonating for folks. Want to versus have to, for sure. That's a big one, Shonda. Fear versus invested, definitely, definitely. Example, David Goodwin, yeah. Yes, Matt Kaminsky, with, I, I'm with you. Walks the talk. Here we go, Liam. The openness to feedback, that's a good one, Bethany, for sure. I've, that's, a, that's actually underrated quality and a skill and a leader of that the open mind to be thoughtful about feedback and not defensive. I like that one. Yeah, Nicole, they're out for themselves. Very good. Care, yeah. Simon Sinek, Gary, I'm with you. The infinite mindset. Yeah, long game players, great listeners. Another really underrated but much needed skill, Cindy. Yeah. Ryan, I do want to jump in. I saw a comment earlier, and I know a lot's coming in that I want to circle back on because it really does get into that compliance conversation. There was a, a comment earlier about how can you be curious as a leader if you're being attacked or if you're being distracted? And gosh, that speaks right there to perhaps you're on a team that is focused more on the compliance than it is on lifting each other up and that commitment. But do you mind talking about that a little bit? How, what do you do in those type of situations? Well, first of all, I think we should note that compliance, there are roles where you have to comply for a yes. spe specific reason. That's, that's not what I mean by compliance. Compliance is not necessarily a bad thing. I think the person where you're forced to comply and you don't want to commit, that's what I mean by that. So there is some nuance. There's some gray area there that we should uh, adhere to because there, there are, there are, there are a comp compliance aspects of all jobs where we have to do it or we will get fired. I'm talking more about the ones where I was forced to versus uh, are the ones I chose to commit to. So I, I think that's, that's an important takeaway. Uh, you mentioned, Amy, so are, are, are your question is, about, is around if you feel attacked so, or, yeah. Right, right. The, the listener was sharing that as we were talking at the beginning about having the kind of this growth mindset and this curiosity, but how do you do that if you're being attacked or if you are distracted? What are some uh, thoughts there? I, I guess I, I have to try to understand that question better. I, I, don't, I don't know why anyone would be attacked for being curious. Uh, I, I'm trying to rack my brain to understand why someone would be attacked. I think uh, one of the common questions I get, Amy, is how to create the culture I want within a place that maybe doesn't have the type of culture I want, or maybe my boss is not that type of person. I've worked for one of those types. We've probably all worked for those one of the types. I spoke with Dr. Henry Cloud about this, and um, he is really big on you, you can't allow that to be an excuse for you to start behaving poorly. Mm. Uh, work to build your the, the type of culture you want work to build that as on as, as in a small of scale as possible your yeah. little team i remember doing this at lexus where we built and now what luckily we had a good culture there but we were able to build our own little team identity we had a name we had a flag we had shirts we had we had good getaways that we'd go to we'd celebrate together we had trophies we had all that we built this culture that was that was built from within the team and then what happened is other teams within the business started asking, what are you guys doing there? How do you do that? How could we do this on our team? And then the members of our team started spreading the culture from within to the other teams and divisions within our business. And I, because of the great people on my team, ended up getting promoted to a much bigger role and asked to do the exact same thing. I remember Sean Fitzpatrick, he's still the CEO at Lexus right now. He, he said, Ryan, 
I'm hiring you to do exactly what you did on that team. Now you have to do it on a bigger scale. Mm-hmm. And my, my first response was, Sean, it was my team. It was the people on that team. Can I bring all of them with me? You know, and as a leader, that's not reality. You can't always do that. So you have to learn from that and figure out how to do that where you are. But I think it is absolutely possible to build the type of culture you want within a small group, even if you're not surrounded by a good culture, and then watch it grow. Now, performance has to be there, obviously. You have to exceed expectations, get results. That's imperative. But then you could see the growth from inward, and that's pretty cool when you see that happening. Absolutely. Great example. I love that. I bet everyone on this call has had a moment where they thought, gosh, I wish leadership was doing this differently. But you know what? Every single one of us can lead from our positions. And it's imperative, honestly, that we do, especially now when we're in this virtual time. I, you know, this, this does take me to some of the elements of your book. And I'd love to jump in. You, you, organize the book into kind of three different areas that I think are just a great way of thinking about how do we lead. And I'd love for you to, and and just for the listeners on the call, that's how do we lead ourselves? How do we build our team? And then what does it really look like to lead our team? A great example that you just provided. But take us through each of those, Ryan. Let's that self-awareness, that leading ourselves, let's start there and unpack that a little bit. And if you can help us think about gosh, how do we lead right now when we're all connecting virtually this way versus in person? Yeah, so the first part, first section you brought up there, Amy, is about leading yourself. And that's the biggest section that I've written about and thought about because you cannot lead anyone else until you effectively lead yourself. And so I'll focus on one key part for today because we don't have... T- 10 hours to talk about this. So let's focus on one key aspect of how you can lead yourself. And I think it's imperative for all of us as leaders, when it comes to leading ourselves, to become a learning machine. That is a phrase uh, originally quoted from Warren Buffett's uh, business partner, Charlie Munger. And, 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 And so I think it's important for each of us to build our frameworks for how we can become a learning machine. And so for me, that's in four parts. And I'll share the four parts for me. And then maybe you can share some part or others can think about how this plays for you. And mine's like a flywheel, a circular. If you read Jim Collins work, you know how the flywheel works. And so here's actually how it looks. Uh, you can see my four part framework and I'll deconstruct it. So there's four parts. So the first, the first part, and my hope is to do a little bit about a little bit of this each day. So First is that learning component, the intake engine. You must be a consumer of knowledge, of information on a regular basis. What is coming in? What are you allowing in? What are you aggressively pursuing to to get to bring in to your mind? That first part, that intake engine is critical. So this is reading books, articles, having one-on-one conversations with mentors, listening to podcasts, whatever it may be, right? The intake engine has to be regularly happening. Then two, you can't just be a learner or a reader. You've got to be a doer. You have to experiment based upon what you've learned. So you're going to test some things out, right? The testing phase, an experimental mindset, Right. So I just talked to James Altucher yesterday, a guy, and he's, he's writing a book called The 10,000 Experiment Rule, not the 10,000 Hour Rule, the 10,000 Experiment Rule, meaning you take from what you've learned and you experiment. Okay, let's say I read a book about how to run great meetings. I can't just read the book. I have to go and actually do it. So the next meeting, I'm going to implement an experiment based upon what I learned about how to run a great meeting. Then the third phase in that, we have to all step back, reflect, understand, and really think about what worked from that experiment. What didn't work from that experiment? What should I keep doing? What should I stop doing? That, that reflection stage is huge. And, and unfortunately, and I'm certainly guilty of this, we sometimes just run right past it and don't even think about that and have an understanding of why were we successful? Why were we not? In the military, they call these after action reviews. We should have regular after action reviews after our experimentations when we tried something new. So we reflect, we have an understanding. Ooh, yeah, that way to open a meeting really worked from what I learned. I'm going to keep doing it. Ooh, I read about a way to close meetings, tried it, Mm, didn't really work not doing that. I'm going to try something else. So you're always having an experimentation mindset. And then fourth, and really important, put yourself in the position of being a teacher. 
one of the greatest tools in the world to being a great learner is to be a fantastic teacher. Because think about any moment in your life where you had to give a presentation, maybe you were a guest lecturer at a university, or you're meeting with a mentee of yours, when you're forced and when you're put in the position to teach, given that we have pride, we want to add value to the lives of other people, the work of your preparation leading up to that big moment where, you, where you're the teacher, that's when so much learning happens. This is why, Amy, I have chosen to make public speaking a big part of what I do or running leadership circles a big part of what I do because it forces me into the position of being a teacher constantly. And I know that is a mechanism for me to be a learner. So if I'm, if I'm always forcing, oh, I got a big speech coming. Oh, I'm, I'm meeting with a Cincinnati chamber. I got to know what I'm talking about. Oh, I'm meeting with a mentee of mine. I want to make sure that she leaves with some useful knowledge that could potentially change her life. I'm going to prepare. What are some questions she may have? I'm going to get ready to go, right? So all that, that process of getting ready to try to add value to someone else's life, that is when the learning happens. And so if you, it, is, it can be uncomfortable, it can be nerve wracking, it can be scary, right? But I am, I, I've learned from the people who are sustaining excellence over the course of my, the past five years of these conversations, Amy, the fact that they are regularly, so this is our zone of competency and comfort. It's right here. Everyone has it right here. My job for myself, if I'm going to properly lead myself, is to regularly stretch that zone. So every day, it's just getting a little bit bigger. I'm getting a little bit more comfortable with things that are uncomfortable, and I'm getting a little bit wiser because I'm forcing myself to have conversations with really intelligent people and then synthesize, distill what I'm learning and teach that. So my, this sphere of competency is now a little bit bigger. So if you talk to me in six months, Amy, I better be a smarter person. You should say like, wow, you've you seem to pick up a few things. I should, I should. If I'm becoming a learning machine, if I'm trying to improve and get better, if I'm trying to be a good leader for other people, I should. And when I think about the leaders in my life who I've wanted to commit to, that's what they're doing on a regular basis. I love this. I love so much that you're talking about. And that's the name of your show. It's the Learning Leader Show. And what it says to me is a number of things that you're on this constant trajectory. Status quo would never be a term that's in your vocabulary. You know, it's how are you continuing to move forward? And I would say for our listeners as well, that you're on this, you're on this call today, which tells us that you're in that growth mindset as well. How do I step up? How can I lead myself? And you brought a couple points that resonate with me. When I think about how do I lead myself, and maybe for many others, I bet there's numerous people on this call that have taken zillions of assessments. And you learn things like, ooh, I'm an activator, or I'm um, a seven in the Enneagram, or you learn about yourself. Mm -hmm. And I will tell you, there's some real benefit in some of those because it helps you understand, huh, it, let me have some self-reflection to really understand because many of our strengths are also our weaknesses, right? And I love that you talked about that reflection piece. So one of the things that I do is, and I bet this is entertainment for many others on the call, I'm walking every day. I'm walking every single day for a solid hour and I try and carve out time to reflect and say, what can I do differently? How do I shift my mindset? How can I show up better and more present in these meetings? What can I do to be a better leader for team members? So it's carving out that time just as much. So Ryan, I love it. You, you talked about you, we got to lead ourselves, but we also have to build our team. Tell us about that. What do you mean by building your team? So uh, there's a lot of aspects to building a team as a new manager. There, there, are, there are hiring decisions. I think for the purpose of today's uh, meeting, let's focus on, uh, I'll take you back. So episode, episode 216, I was talking with Jim Collins. You know, he wrote Good to Great, Great by Choice. There's some of the, the most influential books in all of business. And uh, I, was go I was going on and on about um, understanding my why and sharing what I'm doing. And, and Jim, I remember he, he goes, he, he stopped me kind of cold in my tracks. And he said, listen, you're, you're talking a lot about the what and a lot about the why. And those are certainly important. But, but then he said, who is your who? Who is your who? Who will be your friends? Who's your mentor? Who will you marry? Who will you, who will you intentionally choose to uh, surround yourself with? That 
will be the greatest single determining factor in your long-term success. Who is your who? And so I set this up after that conversation. I said, I need to be more intentional about this. Not only my peer group, my friends, my colleagues, everyone, right? And, and so really I created three buckets. And I think this is, so think about this for yourself. There are three buckets that's ahead, beside, and behind. And I'll explain what each of those are. So uh, the ahead bucket, these are the people who you deeply admire, you respect, perhaps they have done what you want to do. Who are those people in your life that you can regularly have conversations with? And I would rate those conversations, again, back to ratings, but a one to five, a one being aspirational. I wish I could talk to them, but I never have. A five being we have regular meetings on the calendar that are happening, that are recurring. One to five relationship. And so that person ahead of you, again, deep respect, admire, have accomplished things that you would like to do. Sometimes this is a parent, this could be a boss, this could be maybe the CEO of your company, or anybody, an author of a book that you love and you deeply want to meet that person and talk to them, right? So who are those people ahead of you, right? Write down a handful of those. Then second, beside you, and hopefully some of the beside uh, can, can be part of members of this call with each other, but these are the people that you're walking side by side with down this really mm -hmm. tough journey of life. You are not going to judge one another. Very important, mm -hmm. non-judgmental. You're rooting for each other's success. Mm -hmm. Another very important part, we all have that friend or friends who are just a little bit envious or jealous of your success. Little bit. It's human nature. It's natural. It's okay, right? Mm -hmm. I'm not really talking about them being in that beside group. They can still be friends in some, some capacity, but the beside group is I can call you and say, I'm in, I'm into some stuff here. I need some help. What would you do? Right. And you'll do the same for them and you're going to help them and yep. you're going to be that partner for them. Who are those, those, those core groups of people that are beside you that you're helping each other down this tough path. And then behind, who are you helping? Who are you regularly meeting with to help them improve, to grow and to get better? Again, going back to the learning machine part, who are you teaching? If you're not regularly putting yourself in the position of a mentor, one, there's, there's a couple of issues there potentially. One, people aren't asking for your help. Mm -hmm. Then that takes some really tough self-reflective work of why aren't people yeah. asking me what I think or asking me for advice? Or two, you're blowing them off and you're not, you're not paying it forward. You're not giving back. When you've certainly been helped by somebody, it's our duty, our responsibility to help others, perhaps those who are behind us. So regularly putting yourself in the position as a teacher is a great learning tool for you, but it's also doing the right thing. It's also helping other people and it's showing that person, I'm here to help. You know, I'm, I'm here, here to help. I, I wanna, I'm gonna be in a position to, to that to be a mentor for you. And that way you're helping the next generation get a little bit better. So that's, that's, the, that's the question. Who is your who? Who are those few people ahead of you? few people beside you and the few people behind you. And what is your level of relationship? One meaning, meaning mm -hmm. we don't meet five, meaning it's on my calendar, recurring regular meetings with that person. I love it. And Ryan, here's what I would ask earlier for the folks that are on the call. You wrote down things that you're curious about. What do you want to learn about? What are you is top of mind? Think about the ahead, the beside and the behind in those lenses as well. So if you're curious about and wanting to lean in on a certain topic, maybe your ahead, beside and behind might shift a little bit based on what you're curious about right now. So I'm gonna ask people to take a moment, write down ahead, beside, behind. And then in the chat, where do you need to commit right now? Perhaps you're doing great about really tuning in to those people ahead of you and seeking those conversations and those beside, but maybe it's time to step up with the people that are behind. Just go ahead and, and throw it in the chat. Let's get a sense. Where do people need to spend more time and energy? Is it the people ahead of you, beside you, or behind? Let, let's get a sense. Ashley, beside. Matt, all right. Interesting. When I ask this question, Amy, I'll say mostly people say behind. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
beside good Nicole. Hope Nicole, maybe some of the people on this call could play a role in that. Like that's that's the cool thing. We you, you know you have that in common, Johnny. I see you, bud. Sean, Gary, okay. Vlad. Oh. Ryan, something else I would mention as these are coming in is it, this is an easy area to create some guilt for yourself. And sure. I have continued to learn from wonderful mentors that you can have it all, but perhaps you can't have it all at the same time. So you might be in a stage in your life where you can lean in on those who are beside you, but maybe it's your next chapter where you're really strong on who's behind. And, and I think we have to have grace as leaders to say, all right, we're going to show up differently and putting different energy into each of these buckets at different stages. Great point. Great point. It's not always going to be perfectly equal or set up just like your, your work life balance is never yeah. all perfectly set up. It's just not how that's just not, that's uh, the world is really messy and gray. And I think that's something you learn as you mature and get older. Uh, I like to think of like having black and white rules and, with the exception of a few crazy things that the world is just not black and white. It's mm -hmm. so gray. There's nuance to everything. There's almost nothing is definitive. Um, I found that to, Amy, one of the interesting aspects of the people I talk to when I ask them questions, sometimes the most brilliant people, it takes them a minute to kind of get to their answer because they're, they're never, they, they have something what's called they have the strong opinions weekly held, meaning they're always open to changing their mind. They're always, they're saying, well, this is what I believe as of this instant, this moment, until I find better evidence, which I may. And if you look at my history, you'll notice I have changed my mind a lot. That's what people will say and do. And I, I find like some of the most intelligent people are never fully sure of anything. They're always willing and they have an open mind to say, well, if better evidence presents itself, if I read something new, certainly I'm going to experiment with that. And that may become the new norm for this particular topic. And so I think just having an open mind and a willingness to change your mind. I think the, the ability to change your mind is an incredible strength. It shows great confidence. Um, if people like that are called flip floppers, that is very misguided. Um, and and I, I, I am a big believer. And like I said, some of the most intelligent people I've ever met with regularly change their minds on topics, some of them very important because they've learned and they're open to learning and changing their mind. That's great. It's a great point. I, I love that. It, and again, it speaks to that learning and that growth mindset, which is so critical. And Ryan, I'd love for you to take some of these elements that we've been talking about, about leading your team as well. What does it look like? And, and it's specifically, if you have some nuggets, this is a unique time. We're connecting with each other via phone through um, these virtual connections. As you think about just some key lessons on leading our team, but how do we also do it right now? Well, I, I, one of the things, uh, exercises I think it's good for all of us to do right now is to think, how do I want my team to remember how I behaved right now? Yes. They're going to. Yes. This is when leaders step up. That's why it's titled this. This is the moment. This is the moment. It is much easier to lead when your team is winning every game, it's much yeah. easier to lead when the economy is booming and everything is perfect and everyone is buying. It's really hard to lead right now. You may have to lay yeah. people off. You may have to really change how you operate, pivot, right? Amy, my, the, biggest, the biggest aspect of my income for my business that I run yeah. here at Brickstein Meyer is keynote speaking. There are none for the rest of 2020. Sure, right. sure. They're all taking place like this or in some other capacity, a pivot needing to happen for my team. I still have commitments I've made to, to, to the team here. I can't miss. And right. I think we right. all have commitments we've made to our teams that they're looking to us to see how, how are you choosing to respond? And I, I was actually just talking with, with uh, Doug Meyer here uh, mm. recently about this. And he said, how are you feeling? How are you doing? And I said, you know, it's really helpful to be surrounded by very optimistic people. Mm. So, you know, my, my dad is, is probably the most optimistic person I know and, and tied with him is my wife. And mm -hmm. so the people that are closest to me, I see this immense optimism and I think I want to be like that. Yeah. They, they have this magnetism towards them where people are drawn. And I think a lot of it is because of that positivity, the optimism, sure. the energy, you want to be around that. And so that's the way I think a lot of, I, I'm always striving to learn 
from the people around me as to why is that person like have command of this room? Why is that person so intelligent? Why do, why do people like like that person? I mean, mm-hmm. thinking all of that and then try to deconstruct that. And sometimes then you find those behaviors like, I can do that. I can make that choice to have up to wake up today. And after I go on my walk to say, I'm, I am going like, uh, as Scott Belsky said to me, you are as the leader, you're the emotional thermostat of your team. They're all looking to you. They're all looking to you. And as my dad told me, it is your duty as the leader to be in a good mood every day. You got to get rid of the other bad stuff. You got to get rid of it when it comes to the team, they're looking to you. And so if you don't want people to look to you or you don't want to be the emotional thermostat, do not lead. Do not choose to be a leader. You don't have to. It's a choice. Right? Ryan, but it, yeah. I, I'm going to just jump in here because I love that. I'd love to hear you say that again of you as the leader are the emotional thermostat for your team. And that's powerful. I want to dig in there a little bit because we've been having a lot of conversations recently about how do you show up and be authentic? And you know what, in general, positivity is completely one of my strengths and I'm typically the top of the roller coaster kind of gal and showing up in a great place. But I'll tell you, Ryan, there are moments along this journey where I've been scared, I've been nervous for what's gonna happen. And so I'd love for us to talk a little bit about showing up as an authentic leader and saying, hey gang, I'm having a moment. Um, So let's talk about that of, because at some point, if your emotional thermostat isn't legit and you're not being authentic, then it can send a different message to the team. So how do you balance that? Yeah, I, I, I think that uh, it's a great point, Amy. I'm gra- glad you brought that up because it's not all rainbows and butterflies every day. I think it's, I think, I think it's, it's, it's important for you to speak with honesty at all times, right? What's the, the great quote is, uh, it's always better to tell the truth because then you don't have to remember anything. That, that's, <laughs> yes, that's a right. great, great way yeah. to live on a daily basis. I, I think you can still share the fear yeah. about the uncertainty and being fully authentic yeah. as well as though knowing though, so there's, the, we've probably, a lot of people probably heard of E plus R equals O, that's the event plus the response, your response as a leader will equal the outcome. So the, the, the event will determine the outcome. So the, the event has happened and that event has left you a little bit scared or uncertain. Uh, what should we do here? Oh God, are we gonna have to lay people off? Or, uh, you know, yeah, with these type of thoughts. But then, and so you can share, you know, the, 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 the fears of what's happening, but then you get to choose how you respond and that determines the outcome. And, that's where people are going to look at you for your response. We've all had tough moments. We've had adversity. We've had difficult challenges we're dealing with. And then all of us, all of us get to choose how we want to respond in that moment. Do we respond with a plan, with positivity, with optimism, right? Do we respond with that? Or do we respond with saying, feel sorry for me. I'm going to go and sit in the corner. This, this is brutal. You know, this is not fair. Yeah. Uh, if you respond in that manner, like I, nobody wants to follow that person. Right. So I think it's really focusing on how you choose to respond in the midst of being scared and uncertain. Love it. I love it. And, and just, uh, to have some good humor. I, David Goodwin, you're, you're making me laugh over here. I appreciate that Ryan, when you mentioned the comment about, uh, always telling the truth, cause then you don't have to remember anything. Uh, <laughs> David shared, that's a good trait as I remember less with age and, uh, <laughs> A good point. I would also say that humor and being able to really connect with people is a wonderful leadership trait as well. So David, thanks for sharing that. Um, I, you know, Ryan, I'm also, as we think about stepping up, I, I have learned in my life just as much from the mistakes I've made along the way as from the successes. Do you mind just being vulnerable with us for a moment? Is there a mistake or something along the way that you went, man, I just bombed that. And here's what I learned. Do you have some of those moments? And I know I'm putting you on the spot. <laughs> there's a lot of there's a lot of those moments. I I think one of the ones that may be a more interesting story though um, is a moment of failure. Uh, and so there are a lot of mistakes made when you fail at something. So it'd be hard to pinpoint one. But um, I can take you back a little bit earlier, Amy. I mean, w- when I was coming out of high school, I went to Centerville High School. Um, and had a good good high school career as a quarterback, and I signed uh, and, and, and earned a scholarship to play football at Miami University. 
I happen to be the exact same age as another uh, pretty highly touted quarterback recruit. His name was Ben Roethlisberger. And so Ben and I go to Miami at the same time. And uh, over the course of two years, um, eventually the late, great Terry Hepner uh, made the decision that uh, Ben was going to be the starter and I was going to be the backup. And I either was, uh, could be the backup quarterback um, and play another position um, or, or, or move to another position. And so I had really two options to choose from. And, and, and I think it's, it's really useful to think back to moments in your life where you did just about everything within your power and it still wasn't enough. It was certainly useful for me in my formative years to learn that uh, the phrase like life's not fair or that's not fair or you got unlucky with your timing, nobody cares. Nobody cares at all. Um, and they don't owe you anything. Um, and if you want something, you have to earn it. And in that case, Ben earned it and I didn't. He was the better player. Uh, the coach made the right decision. And so my, my then the learning from that is, well, how am I going to choose to respond when I put everything into something and it still wasn't enough because that certainly is going to happen in all of our lives many times over when we're going to run into a brick wall or in my case, an indestructible robot who never got hurt. <laughs> right. So I yep. was not going to leave my uh, and so ultimately, I, I, I transferred to Ohio University because I wanted to take that into my own hands once the competition was over, transfer, and then go compete all over again with another set of quarterbacks to earn that job, which then afforded me the opportunity to be a captain of the team and play after college. And so I think all of us, it's good probably to think about those moments where uh, we've, we've won up against something and we lost or we yeah, failed sure. and how do we choose to respond to that failure what did we learn from that so it will make us better the next time we go to compete or the next time we put ourselves in a challenging situation for me i draw from that on a regular basis because you know sometimes i lose out on things and i feel like i did what i could to, to earn them doesn't matter nobody cares they, yeah. they don't. It's, it's on you to, to respond and to, to bounce back and, and make a choice of how you're going to respond when the, when, the, when the moment gets tough. Ryan, I love that. And there's a theme and a message that you keep bringing up. And that's for all of us to really think about life's going to keep coming at us. But how we respond, we have complete control over. Mm -hmm. We have complete control over how we respond. And that's so valuable. And, and you talked about something earlier of really thinking about your team and how do you want people to remember you during this time? I think that's such an important leadership lesson for all of us. This is such a weird time. So if your team members were to describe or to think about you right now, I wonder what they'd say. And what I'd ask for our listeners, so back to a little assignment for everyone, in the chat, I want you to just throw out a word or two. What do you want to be remembered for right now? How would your team remember you? And team may be internal. It could be your family team. It could be an external team. When you think of that core team, how do you want them to remember you in this phase? Mm, I love it. Yeah. What's nice about the words that are coming in is there's a juxtaposition. There's a, I'm here, I'm here with you, I have empathy. And there's words like, we're forward thinking, I'm dependable, we're resilient, we can do this, we're focused, we're, we're thinking about the future. Um, I, I love it, it and, and it is. This is a mixed time for everyone. Yeah, I'd ask people, as you think about this today, there are some great nuggets from this conversation of do, do, how do we want to be remembered? Do we want to be that committed or that compliant leader? Are people following us because they are committed and they want to? And when you think about that and you think about who you're surrounding yourself with, those are critical, critical elements. So. Ryan, I know we are getting close to the end of our time. It is absolutely hard to believe that uh, just what fun this last hour has been with you. I'd ask for, are there any final nuggets to leave our callers with as they think about stepping up right now as a leader? 
what what would you want to leave people with yeah i think um this this quote can be attributed to many people, maybe originally with Winston Churchill, but uh, I also heard it from Will Gadara. But I think I would think about this: adversity is a terrible thing to waste. <laughs> yeah. And th- and so that's a way that we we view this as an opportunity to show how much we care about our people, to show how much we w- w- that we're there for them, to show how we lead when it's toughest. And, and so that's how I would, I would, I would view that and how my mindset is towards adversity is a terrible thing to waste. This is when leaders are forged. This is when they happen. If you, if you think about, I've been lucky, uh, Amy, to speak with a lot of uh, military leaders. And when you look at their resume or their history, uh, think of general or, or I'm sorry, Admiral William McRaven, who I just spoke with, when you look at his bio, Everything that's in there has something to do with when we are at war, mm, whether the sure. Somali, the Somali pirates took Captain Phillips and he had to go get him back, whether he was leading the raid to mm. go kill Osama bin Laden, mm. right? Everything in there was when we were in, in, in the toughest of moments is when the leaders stepped up and they viewed adversity as an opportunity. And some people think it sounds woo woo. I don't. I think it, that, that, that if you can view it as an opportunity and seriously shift your frame of mind around how you view these moments, your chances, your odds of excellence greatly increase. And so that's the mindset I would ask people to, to work, to shift to. And in some weird way, even being grateful for the opportunity to show your stuff right now. Uh, it's not easy. It's not supposed to be easy. If it was, everyone would do it. Um, it's tough. It's tough. And you're going to have rough days, no yeah. doubt. But, but, it, but it's thinking of it from the, the, the mind frame of this is, a, this is an opportunity for me to show my stuff and I'm going to step up. I love it. I absolutely love it. Yeah. Never waste a good, uh, a good crisis, right? Mm-hmm. Let's take advantage of those moments because not only does it give you a chance to step up, but I will also tell you, When there's a good leader at play, it brings the team together. You rally around a cause, uh, whether you're there in the trenches, and it brings people together to say, yep, we're in this together. Let's do this. And I love that. So thank you. So as before we sign off, we need to make sure that this wasn't just the Ryan and Amy entertainment show this morning. This is about leading and leadership. So we're going to ask all of you, as you were thinking about this last hour, what is the one nugget? What is your commitment to yourself? And we know this, when you write it down or when you put it on a chat in front of a lot of people, it's more likely that you'll actually follow through. So what is the one commitment from what you heard today that you're gonna do? Is it perhaps that you're gonna spend a little more time thinking about those that are behind or beside or ahead of you? Is it that you're gonna think about and reflect on, am I committed or am I more of a compliant? Am I a leader that's creating people to be compliant because they feel like they have to? What is it for you that you took away? Take a moment, make your commitment. I love it, the learning machine. Ryan, you're a great example of leadership really is about being a a, a learner. And uh, yeah, keep being that learner, that learning machine and that cycle, that is fantastic. Wonderful. Well, team, thank you so much. As these are rolling in, all of these commitments, I want to tell you a fun commitment um, that I will share. And we have a, a fantastic partner on the call. And Ryan, I don't even think you know this. And this is a great uh, partner. Kristen McClan is with us today. And for our whole conversation and watching the chat, she captured this conversation graphically. So she will create a visual illustration of this conversation. And I will pass that back out to the group. And I share that with you because as we think about that learning cycle, one of the key elements is reflection. And and some of us are like the written reflection. Some of us like to be up here, but sometimes it's that visual that really hits home. And so Kristen, thank you again for being with us today and being a great partner. Ryan, I've just had a ton of fun uh, being in conversation with you. And I want to thank you again for leading today and and leading tomorrow and leading yesterday. Um, and, And again, 
just a couple things. If you want to follow up with Ryan, here's a great way to do that. You can actually just text learners uh, to the number here on your screen. And, and that way you'll have a great way. Um, there's information about your book. And again, if people are interested in the book, it's Welcome to Management, How to Grow from Top Performer to Excellent Leader. Uh, and you have a great podcast. So there are many, many ways that people can continue to engage Ryan. And thanks again. I also want to do a shout out to our friends at Fifth Third. They um, are great sponsors of our entire leadership platform. So um, thanks again to, to Fifth Third for really helping us put this on. Ryan, thank you. I'm going to let people know about some things coming up, but um, thanks again. This has been great, truly. I, I, I appreciate you having me, Amy. And uh, I love to, I never want these to be one and done. So I'd love to hear from, from all of you for, and, and thank you for investing your time with us today because uh, the, these, are, these are really cool moments to see people choosing to invest their most valuable asset, their time today. And so I'd love to hear from you. If you text learners to 44222, that's a good way that we can continue our dialogue as we, we all progress. Um, and, and, and that's a way to get directly uh, in touch with me because uh, there may be some follow-up conversations that need to be had. And I'd love to, love to have those with you. Sounds great. Absolutely. That's part of the learning model, right? That continued feedback loop. I love it. Yeah. So I just want to do a quick shout out. I know we had people from across the globe, but we also had a number of chamber members that were with us. So thanks for the members tuning in. And thanks for um, people who are not members. If you want to learn more, we would love to tell you how the chamber can help you now and also into the future. Um, we try and do these conversations on a regular basis. So you can see that next week, we're bringing in, uh, this will be a great conversation with Philip Stutz. He's actually out of Florida. He's been doing some fabulous research and consumer insights and going to talk about how in the world do you sell during this time based on the consumer insights from over, I want to say it's over 4,000 people from across the globe. Uh, so I think that'll be a fascinating conversation. And then we're also going to have an additional conversation of uh, if you want to learn more about a member benefit and how you can really have some cost savings with Humana right now, we're always trying to help people lead, move forward, but also uh, we want to help you be responsible during this time. So thank you again, truly, to everyone for being with us from all of us here, at, both at Brixie and Meyer and um, at the Cincinnati USA Regional Chamber. We truly wish you all good health and well wishes. And as we sign off today, we're gonna to encourage everybody, please wear a mask, think about that social distancing. And as we sign off, please go wash your hands. Thanks again, take care. <laughs>